Hello everyone, this is your host Heidi Marble. My co-author psychiatrist Elisa Zalma MD was able to join in on this interview with Moses Farrow. Moses is a licensed therapist with over 20 years of experience in the mental health field. He specializes in adoption trauma. He is a transracially adopted person so he can speak from a lived experience. In this episode, we do touch on subjects like suicide loss and race. Um, we dive deep into what it is to be adopted and what we see as some of the problems and some of the solutions. It is a very powerful episode. Enjoy. Moses Farrell is a licensed marriage and family therapist in adoption trauma with over 20 years in mental health field. He is on a mission to save adoptee lives, sharing his personal experiences as a survivor of abuse, suicide, and suicide loss. He has also become an outspoken advocate for mental health, suicide prevention, anti-racism, and adoption reform. Most recently, he has produced the YouTube videos and gave his first newspaper interview about his family and work. He has also begun the Truth is Louder movement, which encourages adoptees to speak their truths and invites everyone to help save adoptee lives. And I'm just so grateful to have you here and to, to hear your story. And I think if you're comfortable with it, maybe we can just start from the beginning and you tell us your adoption story and, and maybe we can then lead into the issues of suicide. Uh, thank you everybody for the kind uh, invitation into your space and to be part of your project. and. Uh, really to engage in this kind of conversation. Um, and uh, it does make sense to just kind of lead off with who I am, um, since this is really the first time we're all meeting. So it makes sense. Um, and, um, you know, I've been sharing quite a bit about my adoption story, uh, specifically uh, what I wrote in my in my bio that, you know, that you just read about uh, being adopted. Um, being adopted, at, uh, you know, at, at around the age two, uh, the age of two and uh, from South Korea. Uh, and, um, you know, from there, uh, it's like becoming a world traveler, uh, you know, being adopted to uh, New York City um, at, you know, such a young age. And then growing up in a, you know, in a very large uh, and very, um, you know, public facing family. Um, and uh, it, it's been a journey for me in a number of ways where, you know, on one level, it's this search for who I am, uh, trying to piece all of my identities together, uh, which involve being a Korean, uh, involve being um, a Korean American, uh, an Asian American, um, as well as someone who lives with a disability, uh, as well as uh, uh, someone who has grown, grown up in a family uh, where I've, you know, I've experienced uh, three of my siblings passing away, uh, two of which uh, ha are, you know, distinct uh, suicides. Um, and, uh, and then my sister Lark, who uh, had been hospitalized uh, for a medical condition uh, related to being HIV positive, and um, she had chosen not to be resuscitated. Uh, so um, it's carrying layers of trauma uh, that I've experienced in my life that I grew up from a young age. Uh, and uh, so I've also been, you know, outspoken about uh, being a child abuse survivor and experiencing 
uh, just a number of different kinds of abuse uh, growing up on top of the traumas, uh, uh, you know, from the, the losses in my, in my life, uh, on top of the adoption traumas that I experienced from being adopted. Uh, so, uh, you know, this journey is really made up of multiple journeys uh, where for me, uh, you know, um, in adoption circles, we call this uh, coming out of the fog. And the way I define that for myself at this point is really uh, coming to terms with being aware of the traumas and the truths about being adopted. Uh, and then embarking on this other part of the journey to piece myself back together reclaim who I am, reconnect with uh, my roots, um, and, uh, you know, just try to find a way to become whole. Uh, so um, at this point uh, in my life, um, I, can, I can say that I feel I've come out of the fog, there may be a little bit more fog to go uh, for me, but um, uh, I, you know, at this point have found my voice um, and uh, am wanting to use it to not only share my truth, but encourage other adoptees to share theirs. Um, and, um, you know, hopefully, collectively, we can come together as an adoptee community and, in a way, really establish an adoptee culture and really exist as our own entity in society um, and be recognized as such, where many of us uh, who are transracially adopted uh, uh, feel we're caught between two worlds. And, you know, there's, for me, a lot of uh, questions and, and confusion about, well, how much am I Korean? How much am I American? Um, how do I connect? How do I establish? How do I um, acclimate? How do I um, um, you know, appreciate those different parts to myself. Uh, so my solution is it's all of that wrapped up in this new identity as an adoptee and really have space for us to exist as we are, not feel like, well, we need to piece ourselves out for one or the other, because those are the, those are the communities and identities that have existed. I feel like it's, it's time we really establish ourselves. Yes, Moses, I, I love what you wrote on your website about our adoptee legacy. It's crystallized for me what we are doing, our legacy, we are laying down the foundation that will begin the legacy of a great culture of adoptees. To do this, we can no longer deny our past, nor our achievements, or our true heritage. And I think you sharing your out of the fog experience is so, is so interesting because my out of the fog experience actually came when Dr. Zalma sent me an article written by Myra Rybin. And I read about moral injury and adoption trauma. And it was literally an experience that happened to me in a vacuum where I felt I was taken back in reverse and my subconscious woke up and I was just torn through this experience and I just came undone. And I wonder, it seems like, um, I'd like to know more, a little bit more about the self-destructiveness and coming out of the fog. And is it different for all adoptees? Like, I know that I'm just learning about this. So I'm really curious for other adoptees who are listening 
what can out of the fog look like? Can it be, it sounds like your experience might be a little slower. Can you, can you tell us more? Mm. So, so Heidi, uh, <laughs> this is fascinating because I, you know, working as an adoption trauma therapist with other adoptive families and other adoptees and adoptive parents, um, many of which have said, we wish you were around you know, when we were younger or when our children were just adopted, um, you know, and this could mean 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And kind of to your point, uh, I reply back to them. I, I respond saying, well, I was still in the fog. I was still working out my own issues. This is all really kind of a new process for my generation and you know i'm okay saying you know i'm in my in my 40s and this seems to be this seems to have been the process for many of us um where uh there have been um adoptees from you know first generation uh, who are in, in their 60s and 70s who have written books or, or articles and have, you know, tried to um, help us understand about um, the, you know, shall we say the primal wound um, and just start there. Uh, but um, it seems to be finally settling in with more adoptees sharing their stories, writing books, making videos, uh, developing their blogs, um, and really starting to get a grasp of, uh, you know, just what it means to be adopted, which isn't a, a singular experience. You know, there's such a wide spectrum uh, where for me, my story, I'm, I'm kind of on one side of the spectrum and then there's certainly plenty of adoptees who have very positive and very healthy and very happy uh, experiences with their adoptive families um, and uh, all the nuances that go along, um, you know, with that. Uh, so uh, it's, this process, uh, you know, my process, um, and I really do hope, and this is really what I'm working towards, is to shorten the, um, the length of time that it takes for us to come out of the fog. I really would have liked to have lived more of my life out of the fog not being um, in a survival mode or self-protective mode for the majority of my life. Um, oh, I have, a, I have a question about that. I, um, I've, been, um, I've been thinking so much about um, the potential um, power for change that someone like you has as a therapist who's gone through this process on a very personal level and this idea about um, that thing you just said about parents who come to you and said, I wish um, we would have heard from you sooner in terms of helping us like with our children, if I've heard you right. So this is the parent's point of view, uh, you know, in combination with the family structure. Um, I, I also do see a lot of patients who are adopted. And one of the things, um, but I, um, one of the things that has always struck me, and perhaps you can speak to this, is um, a lot of people who uh, are adopted have this sense that they can't talk too much about how they really feel about things. And this may be a big message to parents, whether it's, it's, a, it's a loving environment and or, or an abusive environment, that a lot of the kids feel um, they have to feel, quote, so grateful that they've been taken into this family or they're not allowed to speak about things that they really want to speak about. And that has such a wide range 
you know, from being uncomfortable about, you know, what some kids said to them at school or feeling like they don't want to be around anymore. And um, maybe people can relate to you on a very different level than perhaps they can relate to someone like me because you've had that personal experience. So what do you tell those parents in terms of quote, getting out of the fog faster? How do you help them either help the parents or help the adoptees transcend this in a way that they can enjoy more of their life? I really appreciate this question. Um, and uh, there's many layers to this. So I, I hope we can take a deep dive into this. Uh, so, you know, I've, I've spoken to, uh, to parents. I've also spoken, you know, about this uh, more publicly um, as well. There's a, uh, a link between adoption trauma that adoptees experience. Um, it's not just for adoptees though. It's not just something that we experience. It is something that uh, um, the, the parents experience as well. Uh, they go through their own journey of uh, starting a family um, and that takes on, you know, a range of, you know, just um, potentially real painful experiences uh, and, uh, you know, um, a grief process. But really, you know, to your point, uh, there's a link between adoption trauma and generational trauma. And I like to mention generational trauma because for adoptive parents, uh, much of their um, adoption process uh, is focused more on getting their papers in order, um, going through, um, you know, meetings and home visits and, uh, you know, really just the waiting period. Um, um, I, I do believe that there's more emphasis on uh, adoptive parents entering therapy for themselves, but I'm not sure if it's really, really out there. So I like to point out generational trauma yeah. exists for the adoptive parents who don't resolve their own issues or their own traumas in their lives. Uh, and I think that this is a, a big gaping hole for them um, where, uh, you know, even, uh, even as they go through uh, their own process of, of forming a uh, family, uh, if they're not receiving, you know, therapy and professional help to work through um, those experiences. Um, and um, uh, it's really important to have, uh, tra you know, just traumas resolved uh, or healed or managed in some way before you embark on raising another human being. Because what ends up happening, and this is where, you know, family systems come, comes in, you end up passing on those same attitudes and values and dynamics and patterns of behavior and really ultimately relationship patterns. Um, because what's involved with that is, is uh, how you cope with things, how you communicate, how you relate to people you um love and trust and, and, you know, share uh, a commitment to one another. And if though, yeah, yes, please. Yeah, no, I was, I was just going to say, um, I haven't heard it said quite as well as that. Uh, certainly recently, that's exactly what um, Heidi and I um, are trying to talk about through the, um, give and take we do in, in the book pulled by the root through each chapter. Mm. Um, we do speak to mm. intergenerational trauma through the individual story that's Heidi's. Um, mm. 
the kind of more mm, kind of more psychological psychiatric commentary on each chapter really speaks to that issue. And I, um, that's really great to hear you speak about that from your perspective, both as an adoptee and as a um, therapist that deals with family systems and um, point really well taken about parents. And we've talked about this in our book, but I love what you just said about that. The parents really, in terms of um, not having to transfer this intergenerational trauma, that they have a lot of work to do before they adopt a child. And um, uh, this, of course, will be anonymous, but one uh, person who I've worked with very recently, um, the uh, she and her partner decided ultimately not to adopt a child because they felt they had so much work to do. They started to go through the process, like you said, of all the paperwork and going through it. And one of them was very much about it. And it was um, um, an, an adoption out of, out of the country. So it was going to be a, trans, um, a transracial child that they were going to adopt. And um, perhaps wisely, or they thought about it in a very profound sort of way, and at least for right now have decided not to do it because they realized their own losses that they didn't want to pass on to the child that they were about to adopt. Mm. Mm. Um, it's, some, uh, it's something very, very profound to have to think about. And I would wonder um, if that ever could be part of the adoption process, that that's more of a formalized part of the adoption process. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be very nice to see that uh, certainly be, you know become uh, part of uh, part of a uh, formalized process a standardized process um, uh, for sure there there's several other layers to this I'd like to just um, either touch on or dive into uh, and, you know and I, I appreciate you uh, you know kind of expanding on that initial point it, it, it just mental health in general, I think given the state of affairs in this country and around the world, we're noticing that mental health is really, it's more important in my opinion than physical health, um, than medical health, uh, that many of our issues that manifest in our bodies as diseases, um, come from stress, anxiety, and depression uh, when it's left unchecked or untreated and left to be, uh, you know, turn into chronic conditions. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know if there's anything official about this, but I know uh, a lot of adoptees uh, um, live with things like autoimmune disorders, that. Um, you know, uh, chronic stress, uh, PTSD. Um, and, um, you know, so this is another layer where for adoptive parents, uh, please do not pathologize our trauma responses. They are there for a reason because we start off life uh, needing to survive. And these are our natural instincts to uh, uh, fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. And too often for decades now, these have been mistaken as disorders, psychiatric disorders, such as uh, depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, uh, personality mm -hmm. disorders, eating disorders, uh, PTSD, um, ADHD, uh, um, oppositional defiant disorder. Um, too often adoptees are pathologized and treated for the wrong diagnoses because even though I included PTSD in, in the list, it's often overlooked um, that um, quite often, too often, uh, the issues that stem from being adopted are seen more behaviorally or emotionally. Um, 
And we're just starting to understand developmental trauma or complex PTSD. And for me, these still don't quite get at the root, which for me, I'm saying it's adoption trauma. And uh, if we are to pathologize this, it's really to understand that uh, trauma in general keeps us stuck in a cycle that is recreated over and over. And whether it's throughout the day or at certain times of, of the month or throughout the year uh, with anniversary effects, um, trauma keeps us stuck. And that's one of the, the guiding principles, which is it interferes with our daily living. It's really important to understand the nuances of adoption trauma. Um, so that mental health piece, the mental health piece that I want to point out is that for adoptees, we are adopted into a situation, not by our own choice very often. And I would very much like to see mental health services be uh, offered free to adoptees. Um, and however it needs to be funded, what matters is that we feel protected, we feel supported, um, we feel that uh, we have a chance to come out of the fog um, and you know, be uh, supported by our communities, our countries, our governments, um, our families, our parents, uh, to give us that fighting chance to actually live and thrive and not be stuck in survival mode. Uh, so um, really it's important to me to just lay that down free mental health services with uh, well-trained, well-informed. Um, my preference is to have adoptees who are therapists working with adoptees. Um, yeah, Moses, I think accessibility, that was one of the things I wanted to talk about with you too. And I think maybe this is a good segue into the suicide part of this, because I think that um, it's really hard to ask for help. But when you have the financial barrier as well, it's, it's very difficult. And then I know from my experience as well that through the therapy that I've had, and this is by no fault of the therapist, adoption really never came up. It was almost like the fog is on everyone <laughs> about this issue. So I think, fog. yeah, and, and I feel like these conversations and I love that our pull by the Root team even though they're not directly connected to adoption, they care about the issue. They, they want to be here to support this. And that means so much because I feel like adoptees, we see and know each other. We need other people to see and know as well. And I think about when I was growing up and suffering from anxiety and fear and not understanding why and, and having thoughts of why am I here and it'd just be easier not to be here and, you know, in terms of my family's idea about suicide, it was so shame-based, you know, that's weakness and how dare they. And, you know, and, and so I always thought another fog that that's what it, it was about. But, but what I'm realizing, and I think what, what I would like to say to you too, Moses, is in looking at the body of work that you've created, I think what is so startling to me is that I do not feel like a suicidal ideation and I'm not a therapist. So you guys can, we can battle it out. But I think that a suicidal ideation is not weakness. I think it's that you run out of strength. Like you just get to the point where no one is listening. Why am I here? And, and how should that be a punishable offense? I actually think 
people that get to that point are probably very strong, but they're just tired. And, and, you know, I think what's so startling to me as well is I talked to a friend who lost an adoptee to suicide. And he said that when he went into his room, he found three suicide notes. And he said his computer was open to a suicide forum. And they had no idea that he was in that kind of pain. But even up till the last moments of his life, he was still trying, sorry. He was still trying, Moses. And I think when I think about just the volume of trauma that you have been through as a human and losing your siblings to suicide and your willingness to, to sit in that pain and share their life and hopefully we can prevent I, I hope that this conversation, even though it's going to be difficult, the, the fact that you're willing to share this part, and I really want to know, especially because we have such beautiful therapeutic minds here, the people that are listening, that are in despair, that have run out of strength, what can we tell them? What hope can we give them? And, and why are adoptees more vulnerable? I mean, I just have this huge list of questions. Um, so, I mean, I think that's enough for now, but I would just really love to, to have you just talk to us truthfully about, about all of that. Uh, well, Heidi, I think you've, uh, taken that first step and just opening the conversation and being raw with it. And with that, it's normalizing being able to talk about it. I think that's an incredibly important first step is to normalize this and not stigmatize it, not uh, carry on this feeling of shame and secrecy and withholding and withdrawing, which then leads to feeling very much alone. And being alone in that space where you're absolutely right, you know, Suicide ideation is different than being suicidal. And I think mm -hmm. that's really important to point out because uh, you can have many thoughts throughout the day, throughout your lifetime and not be suicidal. But it's in a way for us, an escape to not feel trapped, to feel like there is a way. It's to give hope, perhaps. And for so many of us, and I'd like to, you know, put in here that with what you shared, how important it is to feel connected and to have these conversations to feel like there is a form, there is a number, there is someone on the other end of that number, there is a way to connect and feel seen and heard. And that is such a central uh, part to uh, being adopted. And in a way, uh, going back to, you know, um, what we talked about before about, you know, this narrative of always feeling like we have to be grateful for being adopted. Um, that's toxic. That needs to be dismantled and deconstructed uh, it, because it goes along with the other narrative that we need to be saved, that in some way we're less than uh, and we're undeserving of and we're not lovable and we're rejects. And that's toxic thinking. And that's toxic thinking for adoptive parents who think we're saving this person, we're saving this life. And this is something that I point out is, well, that, that may be okay on World Adoption Day, 
that may be okay on National Adoption Day, but what happens when we grow up and we come out of the fog and we start facing these traumas and these issues and we're not equipped, as you're saying, we're feeling very much alone and our adoptive parents are confused at the very least why are you behaving this way? Why are you uh, having these issues? Because we've given you everything you've ever wanted. We've given you life. It's toxic. And where, for me, uh, I mean, being transracially adopted, I have to bring this up because of what's happening in this country. Being Asian and growing up in white communities with white parents who don't understand, who ignore, who leave it out of the conversations, who may bring me to therapists who are also white and not adopted, who don't know how to bring it up and normalize these conversations. And so to your point, uh, we have this like handful, these handful of statistics about adoptees and suicide. But the one that always comes to the forefront is that adoptees are four times more likely to attempt suicide. And, you know, I like to pair that with. Uh, what's known as the ACES study and where that measures adverse childhood experiences. And if you have a score of four or more on this list of 10 questions, if you score four or more, you're 1,220% more likely to attempt suicide. But yet adoption is not one of the things listed in this study. That is correct. That is correct. I, um, this was a landmark study. It's uh, from ni- two waves of it from 1995 to 1997, I believe. I believe almost seven, if I'm correct, almost 17,000 people were, uh, uh, gave questionnaire. And um, I did look up what the, um, the questions were that were asked. I could not find in the study particular mention of adoption per se, but I did find one of the um, questions that was asked retrospectively of the adults was um, that counted for one of these scores were as children, um, and you tell me if uh, this is incorrect, that one of the things that um, was discussed was children who felt less comfortable and more afraid to discuss those things that were important to them with their parents or caretakers were um, part of that cohort um, that were um, more likely to attempt or complete suicide. So I would assume then, even though adoption was not mentioned in the study, that um, certainly a percentage of those um, adults um, who answered the questionnaire were adopted. I, I certainly wish that um, uh, even within a landmark study such as that, that there would have been um, more delineation of the groups that had adverse childhood experiences that might have included um, the adoption community um, specifically. Mm-hmm. But they are well represented um, in that study because of the um, adverse childhood experiences they've had as a result of the adoption process. Well, uh, thank you for pointing that out. Um, and, uh, you know, for me, this, this just um, proves that adoptees really are not seen or heard or assessed or um, uh, it's not brought into the therapy um, into the therapy office. Uh, And it's really important um, to look at adoption not as 
the single event, World Adoption Day, Gotcha Day, um, but really as this lifelong experience. And it's important that we create environments in our homes and in our communities and in the mental health community uh, that can offer the, the kind of um, interventions and treatments and conversations that help us feel connected and seen and heard. And it's really that basic to be seen and heard and to have uh, people listen and pay attention and validate and just acknowledge, wow, you really have been through a lot if we really start understanding what it means to be adopted. And that's something we, we haven't touched on, what it means to be adopted, you know, to have multiple layers of your identity uh, missing or worse, disconnected uh, in the act of being relinquished um, or uh, forcefully taken away from your parents. Um, and uh, you, I, I, you know, I don't remember way back then, but I can only imagine um, that being tied to why it's so instinctual for us to, to kick on our need to survive and to be severed from your biological parents and roots. Uh, I often link this with, uh, you know, uh, being part of the, the natural world that if you're left uh, alone in the nest, um, it becomes a life or death situation. Um, and so adoption in a way creates that same experience because even if you're given over to a nice loving couple, they're not connected to you biologically. It's not natural. Uh, and no one seems to understand this um, because again, they're told, the adoptive parents are told, oh, this is your forever family now. This is your child. You can raise them as your own. Um, and uh, it's too often that we as adoptees just inherently feel different, displaced, like we don't fit in, like we don't belong. And for those of us who are transracially adopted, uh, it's very apparent because of the way we look and how we look different. And then we get bullied about that. We get teased. Um, we uh, develop a self-loathing and we call it internalized racism because we don't want to be different. We don't want to be ourselves. We want to fit in. Um, and for a long time, when I would look into the mirror, I didn't see Asian. I saw Superman. I saw the Lone Ranger. I saw, you know, these American figures who are white because that was the world that I grew up in. And, you know, there's a term it's called whitewashing. And, you know, so again, I'm feeling, you know, very compelled during this time that, uh, you know, coming from a different race and being adopted into a family of a different race and culture, ethnicity and ancestry and geography. Uh, these 
aspects need to be acknowledged and recognized. And we need to be raised um, in accordance with our native cultures. We need those references. We need those mirrors. We need to feel connected and trying to force a connection simply because of titles or simply because you're, you know, we've adopted you and now we're family. Uh, no, we need to feel that, not just be told that. Uh, so I, you know, feel very compelled to bring this up um, because as an, an, as an Asian adoptee during this time of um, anti-Asian racism and hate crimes and violence, uh, we are struggling to feel connected because many of us, you know, recognize we are Asian, I'm Korean, uh, but I don't have those cultural and racial reference points throughout my life. And so feeling connected to the Korean culture and the Korean community who are suffering and under threat, um, uh, I you know, find myself struggling to feel like I, you know, can advocate, I can fit in, I can show up and be accepted into uh, the Korean community uh, and the Asian community. Um, because, um, you know, while uh, racism always exists, uh, there are times that myself and other uh, Asian adoptees um, uh, are constantly questioning, well, where do we fit in? Do we belong? Uh, how do we make that happen? Is it right? There's so many layers and so many questions um, that uh, hit right to the core of, well, who are we? Who am I? Um, and too often uh, because we don't speak the language, because we don't have those uh, social references, you know, um, uh, cultural references, uh, it's hard for us to feel connected, to start connecting. Um, and uh, too often um, we're rejected. Uh, we're, we're not seen as part of the native cultures. And this is where for future generations of Asian adoptees, transracial adoptees, please parents um, understand when you pluck us out of a different country and bring us home to your uh, you know, suburban communities or white communities, um, it, you need to recognize what you're undertaking uh, with um, having to dive into being a multicultural family and not whitewash us anymore and have that be another layer of trauma that we have to uh, fight against because, you know, going back to what you're saying, Heidi, um, racial trauma and racial abuse um, is another huge factor and that leads to suicide, especially in the online and social media and cyberbullying circles. Thank you for sharing that, Moses. I've, I, I really appreciate your perspective because I think for me, what, what we all value and I value is I wanna understand as much as I possibly can you know, the experience of other adoptees. And I've thought my, my domestic adoption 
I could sort of morph in. People would ask me occasionally, why don't you look like this person or that person? And just during those moments, I remember the pain it created for me. But to be so outwardly different and to never be able to be, I don't know if anonymous is the right word, but it feels to me, and, and I'm sorry if I'm overstepping, it feels to me that there would never be a break for you, Moses. Like, like at least I got a break. I could kind of just say, okay, I, please don't ask me if I'm adopted. Um, I just want to say that I have empathy for your experience. And I, and I think one of the things that overwhelms me too, when I think about you in our last conversation and you know, I was just reaching out for you and saying, is there hope for us, Moses? <laughs> and you know, it was so crazy. You didn't even hesitate. Like after everything you've been through, do you know what you said to me? <laughs> you said, yes, Heidi, there's hope. And then you followed it by saying, we have to learn to master our trauma. And, and I don't know, coming from... I just want to know how you're still here, Moses. Like, please tell me, where do you get the strength? What have, if you're willing to share, what have been your coping mechanisms and how, how have you become this compassionate therapist and how did you survive? I just, I, I think it could help people if, if they knew like that interior part of you that that has been able to navigate this? Uh, well, thank you, you know, thank you for bringing that back to, yes, there is hope. Uh, there's hope because we do have these survival instincts that are imprinted on us. Um, it's part of, you know, the natural world. Uh, uh, but surviving is not enough. And we're not built to take on a lifetime of stress. We're not, we're not built to take on chronic uh, issues, chronic anxiety, chronic depression. We're just, we're not built for that. It wears us down. Um, and you know, so I know you're asking, you know, how am I still here? Uh, for, for me, um, I had people I could safely connect with throughout my life. Uh, I want to say it wasn't many. And, you know, there's um, uh, a study out there. Uh, uh, it's specific to the LGBT Q, you know, community for youth, but it goes something like, you know, all it takes is one caring adult to decrease the suicide uh, rate for LGBTQ youth by 33%. One caring adult. And if we think about how many supposed caring adults a child has, um, you know, as they grow up. And, you know, I also need to recognize uh, the perspective of privilege, right? And I do need to recognize as a person of color, you know, the overarching uh, uh, realm of white supremacy and white privilege that I grew up in, you know? So, you know, for me, what that meant is I had doctors, I had teachers, I had, um, coaches, I had librarians, I had, um, people in my life, uh, that I could turn to and, establish uh, positive connections that felt safe to me. Um, and, you know, so there's also this thing about, well, confusing survival with resilience. 
And it's really important, you know, not to reward and not to reinforce survival, right? Our fight, flight, freeze, and fawn responses. But certainly it's really important to reinforce uh, resilience and being able to face reality, face issues and work through them. Uh, if, that, if that requires help and support from others. But that's different than surviving. And, you know, and I really appreciate you kind of framing it that way. How did I survive all this time? Well, that's exactly what I've done. And even though I've had years of therapy and therapists who were not adoption informed, let alone adoption trauma informed, um, what my perspective now on that is that they just prolonged my being in the fog that they didn't help me. It was my survival instincts that got me through those years. And they just helped keep me in the fog longer because they didn't address the core issues of what I was, what I was struggling with, what I was going through. Um, you know, so it's uh, the power of connection. It's the power of finding any which way to feel safe. And that's really what it just comes down to for me is finding um, that feeling of safe. And there's a quote, uh, you know, since I know you like quotes, there's a quote that I like. It's by um, uh, a Danish philosopher, uh, Alexander Den Heyer. And it goes something like, um, when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows and not the flower. And so it's about the communities. It's about our families. It's about our relationships, including the relationship with ourselves. Um, these are the environments in which we need to engender a sense of safety uh, and security. But uh, safety is really the antidote to trauma, right? Which is based in fear, which is based in not feeling safe, feeling like there's threats within ourselves, within our relationships, our families, parents, teachers, anyone who demonstrates a lack of understanding or empathy, right? Not able to see us or hear us or acknowledge our experience and validate that for us. They automatically become threats to us. And when, the, when you become a threat, it takes a long time to undo that because it's instinctual for us. Wow, uh, Moses. So, so for me, so so beautifully said. So for me, it's finding ways to create safe environments within ourselves and around around ourselves. Beautiful. Oh, and I hope Moses, you'll come back and visit us again because I didn't even get halfway through all my stuff, so you have to come back. <laughs> Uh, well, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, you know, I think this is a conversation where we understand there's just so many layers and you can't capture it all in one hour conversation. Uh, it really deserves to be an ongoing conversation. So I hope that, you know, besides this podcast, people will have thoughtful and provocative uh, conversations and thought, you know, just um, things that come out of uh, what we've talked about uh, to, you know, carry into their lives and, you know, think further and more deeply about. Um, and, uh, you know, it is an ongoing conversation for sure. That is very true. <laughs>